Kanjavi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Sunjavi Hari Gopi Jana Badabha Yeri Varadhadi Gopi Jana Badabha Yeri Varadhadi Jasodanandana Braja Janarandana Jasodanandana Braja Janarandana <coughs> Jamuna Tiravana Chadi Jamuna Tira Mana Chadi Jayada Dhamada Bhakunya Bihari Kunjabi Hadi Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hadi Gopi Jana Badlabha Giri Varadha Gopi Jana Bhanda Bhagini Bhada Jasodanandana Braja Janarandana Jasodanandana Braja Janarandana Jamuna Tira Vana Chadi Jamuna Tira Vana Chadi Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Vishnu Pat Paramahamsa Pani Vidaka Chaturja Asta Tarasata Si Sri Madhis Divine Grace Si Si Bhakti Vedanta Swami Siddha Prabhupada Ki Ananta Koti Vaishnavrinda Ki Grantha Raj Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Shri Shri Ram Chandra Maha Mahotsav Ki Samveda Bhakta Vrinda Ki Nathai Gopimanandi All glories to the assembled devotees Glories to Shri Guru and Shri Gauranga In honor of Ramchandra's appearance, we'll speak something from Lord Ramchandra Rules the World, Canto 9, Chapter 11, Text 23. Purusho Ramacharitam Shavanair Upadarayan Anrisham Shaparo Rajan 
karma bandhaya vimuchate purusho rama charitam shravanaya upadharayan anrashamsya paro rajan karma bandhaya vimuchate Ramacharitam Shravanaya Upadharayan Anrasham Shaparo Rajan Karma Bandhaya Vimuchate Purusha Ramacharitam Shravanaya Upadharayan Anrasham Syaparo Rajan Karma Bandhaya Vimuchate Purusha Rama Charitam Shavanaya Upadharayan Anrasham Syaparo Ladies, Purusha Rama Charitam Shravanaya Upadharayan Anrasham Syaparo Rajan Karabandhari Muchate Purusha Rama Charitam Shravanaya Upadharayan Anrasham Syaparo Rajan Karma Bandhaya Vimuchate Purusha Rama Charitam Shravanaya Upadharayan Karma Bandhaya Vimuchate Purushaha Any person Rama Charitam The narration concerning the activities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead Lord Ramachandra Shravanai by oral reception Upadharayan Simply by the this process of hearing. Anrashamsya para becomes completely free from envy. Rajan O King Parikshit. Karma Bandhai by the bondage of fruitive activities. Vimuchate, one becomes liberated. Translation, O King Prikshit, anyone who orally receives the narrations concerning the characteristics of Lord Ramachandra's pastimes will ultimately be freed from the disease of envy and thus be liberated from the bondage of fruitive activities. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. Here, in this material world, everyone is envious of someone else. Even in religious life, it is sometimes found that if one devotee has advanced in spiritual activities, other devotees are envious of him. Such envious devotees are not completely freed from the bondage of birth and death. As long as one is not completely free from the cause of birth and death, one cannot enter the sanatana dham or the eternal pastimes of the Lord. One becomes envious because of being influenced by the designation of the body. But the liberated devotee has nothing to do with the body and therefore 
he is completely on the transcendental platform. A devotee is never envious of anyone, even his enemy, because the devotee knows that the Lord is his supreme protector. He thinks, what harm can the so-called enemy do? Thus, a devotee is confident about his protection. The Lord says, Yeyatamam prapadyante tang sadaiva bhajam yaham According to the purport quote, this is a translation, according to the proportion of one's surrender unto me, I respond accordingly. Unquote. A devotee must, therefore, be completely free from envy, especially of other devotees. To envy other devotees is a great offense, a Vaishnava Parad. A devotee who constantly engages in hearing and chanting Shravana, Kirtana, is certainly freed from the disease of envy. And thus he becomes eligible to go back home, back to Godhead. So now we know what to do on Ram Nomi, right? Purusha, Purusho Rama Charitam Shravanayar Upadharayan An Anrashamsya Paro Rajan Karma Bandhair Vimuchate. O King Parikshit, anyone who orally receives the narrations concerning the characteristics of Lord Ramachandra's pastimes will ultimately be freed from the disease of envy and thus be liberated from the bondage of fruitive activities. One of the students yesterday at the college program was asking, why do we fast on the appearance days of the Lord? Um... The, the 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 instruction that Prabhupada gave was on such auspicious days one tries to diminish demands of the body and increase instead in its place attentive hearing and chanting to um, to perform tapo divyam transcendental austerity and that tapo divyam includes hearing. When Lord Brahma heard the syllables, tapa, 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 it's, it's for us too. <laughs> it, it's, it, it's an instruction. You're inquisitive about who you are, your purpose of existence and what you're to do, tapa. Because through that tapa, control of the... So he went back to the lotus flower and did his tapa to qualify him to then, in the Sri Brahma Samhita describes, he then received some instruction. So to qualify us to receive some instruction. We get lots of instructions we don't receive but it's the ones that we receive <laughs> that will be most beneficial. And through tapo divyam, transcendental tapa, just as Rishabdev, we're reading in the regular morning class about Rishabdev. That's his instruction. Putrakayena satvam should yet. Makes one's existence pure. And then when we're, so Saraswati, not the goddess of learning, Saraswati, but a direct expansion of the internal potency of the Lord. She instructed Brahma, take this sound vibration. She gave him a mantra, Gopal mantra. And by chanting this mantra, all the things that you desire will be fulfilled. You better be careful what you desire. But um, the, 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 the heart's ultimate desire is to be with our lovable master. 
in this case Lord Ramachandra, for the um, reference in this purport is being made to the Sanatan Dham, which relates to the previous verse. I mean, the two verses are tied together. Text 22 reads, Lord Ramachandra returned to his abode, to which bhakti yogis are promoted. This is the place to which all the inhabitants of Ayodhya went after they served the Lord in his manifest pastimes by offering his obeisances, by offering him obeisances, touching his lotus feet, fully observing him as a father-like king, sitting or lying down with him like equals, or even just accompanying him. <clears throat> so something about Lord Ramachandra revealed in this um, previous verse is um, there are ex loving exchanges with Lord Ramachandra that are beyond the level of exchanges in Vaikuntha. Meaning, there's, there's an intimacy in affection with Ramachandra that one will not find in Vaikuntha. Because Vaikuntha, the mood is very strong, Aishvarya, which is it's conducive to a particular type of love. In, in Brihat Bhagavatamrita, that it delineates in the conversations with Gopal Kumar, that the realm of Ayodhya is above the realm of Vaikuntha, but it's before Goloka Vrindavan. So the distinction between Vaikuntha and Ayodhya is this intimacy. We don't find residents of Vaikuntha sitting or lying down with him like equals. It's not, it's not equals. He's, so Ramchandra is also, he's like the father to all the citizens. But his demeanor is very welcoming in, to, to such a degree that, it, well, in many ways, he takes a subordinate position, like Krishna does. He takes a subordinate position or an equal position. There's, 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 the intimacy diminishes the on reverence, or it eclipses the on reverence to allow for greater degrees of intimacy. And in Goloka Vrindavan, there's intimacy. <laughs> Madhurya is so strong that the residents of Vrindavan don't see him as the majestic father. He's, he's a little cowherd boy who's our dear friend or the beloved of our eyes and our hearts, the Madhurya Rasa, or little boy. So there's Madhurya also in the pastimes of Ram where he appears as a small child. Um... We don't have that in Vaikuntha. He's not a small child in Vaikuntha. He's the majestic Lord. So it's, it's a, um, in terms of rasa, it's above Vaikuntha. And it's not, it, it's, it's the gateway to Goloka Vrindavan. And the residents of Ayodhya, on earth, when the pastimes of Ram were completed, he, they, they attained his abode. 60,000 pure devotees. And we know what it was like to have one pure devotee. There was Srila Prabhupada present on earth. 60,000 ascended to Ayodhya 
with Lord Ram when he returned. Except for one. Hanuman. He was given a service to remain behind and propagate the, the glories of Lord Ramachandra. And Hanuman just loves service. But anyone who loves service also likes service in union, not just all the time service in separation, at least sometimes service. In, so his service in union was made possible just by hearing. So he was, the Hanuman, steeped, absorbed in hearing and remembering and reciting the glories of Ram. And those who are Ram Bhaktas can also be absorbed in Ram by hearing, chanting, and remembering. Shrotavya kirti tavya shadyaya puja stanityada. So this verse is saying, um, Shravanayar, by the process of hearing, by oral reception, Upadharayan, simply, doesn't require a big ritual. It's, the, this, it's a very simple process. Upadharyan. Simply by this. Shravanam. Shravanayar. One becomes completely free from envy. An rishamsha paro rajan. Um, the, 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 the contamination of envy is removed. Try to get rid of envy some other way. I mean, I'm not advocating it, but if, if one does try to do that, you'll find that you can't get free from it that way. So whatever the other ways, way or ways. There are ways to, um, like antidotes that, that minimize or reduce the influence of envy, but it doesn't remove it from the heart, except for this one, because the, the removal of envy from the heart starts, or the presence of envy in the heart starts with envy towards the personality of Godhead, and then in turn envy towards others who are bearing some of the opulence of the personality of Godhead, maybe a fragmental speck, but envy towards the person is indicative of a primordial envy towards the personality of Godhead. That's clear, right? Envy towards others indicates envy towards the source of those others. Whatever it is that those others have that one is envious of, is envy of, of the personality of Godhead. So that, that envy can be rooted out by this very simple process hearing the glories of the Lord. Rama chaditam. Um, narrations concerning the characteristics of Lord Ramachandra's pastimes. Lord Ramachandra's pastimes are, are filled with the most exalted virtue most exalted virtue, again and again and again and again. Anyone who has spent time reading Ramayana knows what I'm speaking about. It's just, just, just hearing it, it, it lifts one to the realm of at least, you know, contemplating virtue, <laughs> resonating with virtue, Becoming virtuous. In, in, in a standard that um, is transcendental. You know, the, the virtue of minus transcendental virtue, it's like a Boy Scout or something. Be truthful, friendly, cheerful, reverent brave, clean, and something else. You know, just be virtuous. But what, you know, what, 
what does that mean? And what, what do Boy Scouts emblemize virtue? <laughs> but Ramchandra emblemizes virtue. And hearing about Ramchandra does something that hearing about a Boy Scout isn't going to do. It's, it's transcendental. Transcendental. And that, that transcendental vibration, hearing of these Rama Charitam, the, the transcendental characteristics of his pastimes, it carries one to this transcendental virtuous position where affection and affinity and attraction for the personality of Godhead awakens, thus diminishing envy. And then an envy in the world. It's like a, it's, it's a panacea for Kali Yuga. Because Kali Yuga is based on un, uncontrollable quarrel and strife between a person and person, family member and family member, one, one group and another group, one nation, another nation, and, and so on. One tribe and another tribe. I don't know so much about it, but hearing a little bit from Mukti Tirtha Swami, it's, you know, it's risk your life. He was describing once when he was asked, they wanted to make him a king in some tribe. And he knew what that meant. It meant like he'd be the target for the opposing tribes <laughs> to get his head. So it's like, it's, it's really risky. What are you going to do? If you're not part of a tribe, then you're, you're chopped. And if you're part of a tribe, you're chopped. So what do you do? Be transcendental. You know, don't stay too long in Africa. <laughs> That's kind of part of what he decided. He'd make like, you know, visits and do things and then go, go somewhere else for a while. So, um, envy, uh, Prabhupada explicitly says, one becomes envious because of being influenced by the designation of the body. Hmm. Groupism, tribalism, you know, this community, that community. Um, I'll, I'll share something nice. It's like a little bit over here on the side, but... Um, Yesterday, I think it was yesterday, my days are blurred, it was yesterday, um, no, anyway, yeah, yeah, anyway, yes, I think it was yesterday. Yesterday I went to, I, I met with the, the Chinese students that have been interning under some program at Illinois Institute of Technology. It's called, it has an acronym, ACL or ALC or something. It's where foreign students are enrolled in the, the institute, the college, and there's a program for them if they want to intern, get a sense of how things work in America. Because they've come to America to study because the, the system of study is valued, and they also want to get a sense of like how, how, how it works, how the internal processing, not just the IB Tower part, but on the ground part, what is it, how does it work? So some students signed up, and Avello, knowing how the university works, approached the, the business school and said, I've, I have a project that some people in marketing can um, take part in. They can market Krishna consciousness. And the, I'm paraphrasing here, but the man said, oh, that sounds very creative. I'll see if there's some people interested. And people didn't know what they were signing up for, and they signed up for it. And, and then they, when they found out what it was, it was, they shared. So this is after one year, they shared um, what they learned, what their experience was. And there were, there were four interns plus their friends. So they shared... Two of them. The first was an uh oh experience. Uh oh. This is a religion, and I know what religions do. They try to like grab a hold of you and make you part of their religion. 
So they didn't want to, they, they didn't say no, but they didn't participate. <laughs> so Avella worked all that out and said, no, 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 it's not like that. This is marketing. Marketing. And their report was about the marketing. You know, they were standing at the door, those that live here know that, you know, the, the giant Vijay program. And then they were videoing people, you know, devotees, and, and, um, and they worked in the gift shop, and they did the Krishna lunch program. They volunteered to, like, market Krishna lunch, and they were saying, I'm really shy, I, you know, I didn't know what to do, but once I got into it, it was fun. And You, you remember some of them, Rasika Manjari? Once or twice, okay. Well, well, the, the main thing that they spoke about was their their apprehension barrier broke down when they came to the temple, and they experienced you know uniformly they said energetic, <laughs> I mean, you know the kirtan. I guess they're not used to seeing what we do during kirtan at Sunday program. Not too many people are. And then they said um, different words, but like, you know, there, there's, so, there's so much diver, uh, diversification, that was the word. There's so many different types of people. You know, the Spanish people, the Russian people, the American people, the Indian people, some of us Chinese people, and some Polish people, and some, you know, just like the variety. And everybody, they, several of them, three of them said, um, like a family. Like everybody treated everybody like their family members. And I kept my mouth shut, but, um, you know, get a little closer, you can see some other things besides everyone treats everybody like family. But that was their impression, which was, it was encouraging, because I've heard other things from people that come to temples, not just this temple, and their, their first impression isn't what, how, what they described. And um, just, this is even more remote, but their understanding of what Krishna consciousness is was absent. I mean, what they understood, they, they didn't understand, one got it. Well, maybe one and a half. But it, what it told me is, when we have our Sunday program, we have to be tuned into the fact that there's new people and our speaking needs to be according to new people. And you know, the, the people that have come forever, they probably need it too, but see, some of them do. But you know, what are people going to understand about what our movement is, what, you know, what, what our message is, if it's either too high or too abstract or something. Anyway, just get back to our Ramchandra. Um, those who are in the bodily conception of life, from that it flows, there will be envy or, or groupism. This group, that group, so one of the ways to transcend groupism is stop identifying with the body. Our group, their group, us and them. It's, it's, uh, it's, it inhibits the mood of bhakti. It, it inhibits our ability, what's being said here specifically, it, it inhibits one's ability to go back to Godhead. And uh, those that did go back to Godhead from the previous verse, they went to the, the planet of the bhakti yogis. Ramchandra went and took them with him, and that's where they that's what they do, bhakti yoga. That's not you know without without material bodies. Um, the description of Ayodhya, so just like there's you say Goloka and Gokula. Goloka referring to Krishna's abode in the spiritual sky. And Gokula refers to 
Krishna's place of pastimes in Boma Vrindavan, the worldly realm. Just as there's Goloka and Gokula, there is also Ayodhya in the spiritual realm, as there is Ayodhya uh, in the earthly realm. And they are non different, which means that um, Dasarath is there in, in Ayodhya, just as Mother Jasoda and Nanda Maharaj. They're, they're eternal associates of Lord Ram. And as he descends, they descend, or expansions of them descend, and um, perform pastimes with Lord Ram for his pleasure. And when they returned, they returned in their same forms because their their spiritual identity. It's not like they assumed a you know a four armed Vaikuntha form. You know, the the whole entourage of Lord Ram, you know, the monkeys and you know the whole program, they exist in the spiritual world. And they're transcendental associates. And Ram accepts the service of them because of their love for him. And by that, so the, by that acceptance of service, one becomes eligible for the spiritual kingdom. And in that spiritual kingdom, the, the, the two points that are made in this verse, yeah, Anrishamsya paro, envy is eliminated. And karma bandhai bimuchate, one becomes freed from the bondage of karma. So one can perform all these wonderful activities in service to Lord Ramachandra. Or within our lives, one can serve the personality of Godhead. The, the, the starting point of that is hearing. Chindanti kovidas tasyat. That the 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 sword of the the sound vibration of the glories of the personality of Godhead cuts the knot of material affinity. The potency is there. The capacity is there, depending or proportionate to the quality of our hearing and the quality of our hearing will also then determine how much freed we become from the bodily conception of life and calculating things in terms of sense gratification and bodily enjoyment and position and glory and honor and recognition and all of that contamination and instead simply serving the personality of Godhead. What was that? Oh. simply serving the personality of Godhead through the process of hearing. So, um, hopefully there'll be time in your schedule today, especially on the appearance days of the Lord, or Akadasis, those, those special um, sacred days, they're uh, for increasing our hearing and chanting. So we do, we do hearing and chanting every day, and this is a day for increasing hearing and chanting, and especially auspicious is to hear and chant about the pastimes of Lord Ramachandra, and, and specifically here the, the transcendental characteristics of his pastimes. So not just hearing the pastimes, but catching hold of um, his virtue, for example. I'll just go back one more verse. And um, No. Shri 
Shukadev Goswami, after hearing... Maharaj Prikshit inquired from Shukadev Goswami, how did Lord Ramchandra conduct himself? And how did he behave in relationship with his brothers, who were expansions of his own self? And how did his brothers and the inhabitants of Ayodhya treat him? This is you know, like pursuing this Ram Charitam, the transcendental characteristics of him and his loving exchanges with others. Maharaj Prichet is expert. Keep, keep the conversation going. <laughs> he asks specific to this. Because this, Ram Charitam, can produce the other. So he wants to hear Ram Charitam. Shukadev Goswami replied, After accepting the throne of the government by the fervent request of his younger brother Bharata, Lord Ramachandra ordered his younger brothers to go out and conquer the entire world. I want a bigger kingdom. That wasn't it. While he personally remained in the capital to give audience to all the citizens and residents of the palace and supervise the government affairs with his other assistants. Just long purport, but a read short paragraph. The personality of God does not allow any of his devotees or assistants to be engaged in sense gratification. The younger brothers of Lord Ramachandra were at home, enjoying the personal presence of the personality of Godhead. But the Lord ordered them to go out and achieve victory over all the world. It was the custom, and this custom in some places is still current, that all other kings would have to accept the supremacy of the emperor. If the king of a small state did not accept the emperor's supremacy, there would be a fight, and the king of the small state would be obliged to accept the emperor as the supreme. Otherwise, it would not be possible for the emperor to rule the country. Lord Ramachandra showed his favor to his brothers by ordering them to go out. Then he speaks. Many of the Lord's devotees residing in Vrindavan have taken the vow to not leave Vrindavan to preach Krishna consciousness. But the Lord says that Krishna consciousness should be spread all over the world in every town and every village. This is the order of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So Prabhupada is like our Lord Ramachandra. <laughs> He would engage those who wanted his association. I, I, anyway, just Prabhupada appreciation. I, a, a few devotees who had Prabhupada's association described how Prabhupada would do like that. And just one of them is Ridai Nandamarsh. Um, Prabhupada was made his headquarters at least in the, in the West in Los Angeles. So many devotees would go to Los Angeles. And Rita and Maharaj described that he would kind of go and just hang out to get Prabhupada's association. And Prabhupada would look at him and say, what are you doing here? <laughs> well, I came to get your association. Very nice. You can stay for three days and then you go back to South America. Or, and, and others. Tamal Krishna Maharaj and Hari Kesh would describe, and when Prabhupada asked them to go preach, oh, it was devastation. Because they wanted Prabhupada's association, but he was, it, it, for their benefit, and uh, for the benefit of, of others, just as he had been sent by Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. So I thought, if we have a little time, I could describe one pastime like that. That's while Ram was ruling in Ayodhya. First, again, this Ram Charitam is the, is the theme. Um, as was the practice uh, for exalted kings, there were certain times during the course of a week or a, a day when any citizen 
with any problem could directly come and speak to the king. Now, what would that be like if the mayor of Chicago had that policy? Or some any other government officer? But this was how incredible, how incredibly peaceful and, and, and nice was the kingdom is when Ram would, would leave that time open, nobody would come because everyone was happy. Not like this, oh, we don't want to bother him with our petty things. They just didn't have petty things. Um, the description in Valmiki Ramayan is, one time a dog came to the gate and the the guard said, go away, <laughs> you're a dog. He said, uh, the dog spoke, by the way. <laughs> the dog said, I, I want to see the king. And he'll get away. I want to see the king. You go ask the king if he'll see me. He said, all right, I'll send a messenger. You, you just stay here. Woof, woof. So Ram said immediately, bring him. So he, he, he brought the dog. And um, see if I can remember this, because it's very intricate. Um, the dog said, the dog had, a, had, a, had mangled face and broken features. Parts of his face were broken. And so he said, I have a complaint. There's, there's a priest in one of the temples, and he, he beat me so severely I've, I look like this. Something should be done. It's not right. A priest shouldn't just beat a dog. Even I'm a dog. It can't, can't do that. So Ram requested someone to fetch the priest, bring him before the court, before, before the royal assembly. And the priest came. And, and, the, and I may be getting some of the details wrong, but it's something like this. Ram asked the priest, did, did this happen? And the priest, because I, I'm a Brahmin, I have to say, it's, it's true. But, you know, here are the circumstances. And um, I, I've, I've just been through these the one series of difficulties after the next, after the next, after the next. And that particular day, I was going out uh, performing Madhukari from the temple on behalf of the Lord. And everyone treated me so dismissively that it just, the whole day went like that. So by the end of the day, I saw the dog. And I just took out my frustration on the dog and I let him have it and kicked him and beat him and mangled him. So I admit having done the wrong, you're the king, you may punish me as you like. And... Ram turned to his brothers and said, what should be the proper punishment? And they said, the dog should decide what should be the proper punishment. So Ram said, this is very good. And he requested the dog to decide. And the dog said that he should be made the, the head priest of that temple. And everyone was astonished. But Ram said, so be it. You're the head priest of the temple. I'll make all the arrangements. And then there was some conversation that said, you know, what's going on? What's going on? Why did he say that? So the dog was asked for an explanation. And he said, in my previous life, I was the head priest of that temple. And because of my position of being the head priest of the temple, I was very proud and because I was very, because pride was in my heart, I did many cruel things to many people out of pride. And in this way, I've become a dog. And I've been now beaten and mangled by this priest. It's only just deserved for my wrongs. So if the Brahmin, if the priest has understood the wrong that he's done and his heart is corrected, he can become the head priest and not become proud. But if he hasn't, then 
he'll follow the same path and end up becoming a dog, like me. But no, it's, it's in his hand rather than me judge him. It's in his hand. He can go up or go down. And everyone appreciated the, the wisdom of that decision. Then some time passed, another day, a group of sages came from Madhu, Madhupuri. Madhupuri is a name of Madhuvan. Madhuvan is one of the forests in Vrindavan. <clears throat> and I forget the name of the sage, and his associates came to see Ram and um, let them know that there's this um, terrible Rakshasa demon named Lavanasura. And he's, he's making it impossible for us as sages. It, our, our life is at risk. And you've defeated so many such Rakshasa demons in, the, in your time in the Dundak forest. So therefore, you, we've come to you and ask you, please correct the situation. Use your Kshatriya skill. Somehow give us protection. So um, Ram acknowledged their request and then he asked a pertinent question. He said, in order to understand how to deal with uh, an aggressor, one needs to know their strength. Can you give some description of the strength? Now I can't remember the, the description, the detail of the description. But he, he something like, um, there was, there was another demon who heard that love and Asura was very powerful and he came to the gate of his palace and he challenged him and love and Asura picked up this demon and tossed him miles and smashed him and pulverized him and something. No, 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 no. It was, it was, he, he, he love and Asura went to uh, he, he, he went to the demigods and challenged the demigods. And the, 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 the demigods said, oh, you're so powerful, we're no match for you. But if you want to know who's a match for you, they gave you know, somebody that's a match for you. And so he went to that someone and pulverized them. Something, I forget exactly. And... You know, he you know defeated their entire army and single-handedly, and you know he's like this big monster person, very very powerful. So, Ram, and oh yeah, he he got his power from his father. Yes, his he said his his father was named Madhu. His Madhu was a demon, as was Lavana, but his Madhu was the, a different kind of demon. Madhu was very well disposed to the demigods. And um, in, in, in many ways, he just served them and respected them and honored them. And so much so that Lord Shiva came before him and offered him a gift. His gift was an expansion of his trident. So, and, and, and he said, with this trident, you will be able to destroy any enemy. No one can harm you. Always keep it by your side. And when you release it, it will destroy your enemy and come back in your hand. You're invincible. So, Madhu used it properly, but he had a son who was the other type of personality. And as much as Madhu tried to correct his son, he was incorrigible. So he, out of disgust, out of disgust, he left 
his kingdom, turned the kingdom over to his son, and including he gave the trident to his son. So his son is now an invincible demon. Already very, very powerful. And the advice was, if you engage in combat with him, make sure he doesn't have his trident in his hand because he's invincible. So the stage was set and Ram said, very well, which of, which of you brothers would like to do the service? And Lakshman was up first. <laughs> Let me go. And um, no, no, Shatrugna said, "Let me go." And then, older than Shatrugna was um, Lakshman. Lakshman said, "I, I'd like to go. I like to do this service for Ram." And Ram said, "Well, Shatrugna spoke first. He said, "Oh, I'm just, I'm proud. I was just feeling Lakshman." He got to be with you all the time and Bharata was serving as the king and I don't get to do anything. So I was thinking it'd be nice if I could do something. But that's just my pride and Bharata or Lakshman should do. So Ram said, no, no, you, you do. You spoke first and it's, I, you're well suited for this engagement. So, But you have to prepare yourself because this is not an ordinary foe. So that preparation was made. Ram coronated him as king of Madhupuri and Shatrugna went in a, in a, with a grand celebration. Ram gave him a special, special mantras and a special sword and special this and special that so he would be able to defeat. He just gave him this Caution, when you approach, don't approach him with the, when he, he can have the trident in his hand because it may be very difficult to defeat him. So he went. He went to, on his way, he stopped at Valmiki's hermitage and there he saw the birth of love and Kush and the ceremony that was performed. And then he went and he waited some distance because it wasn't the right season to go and he waited for the right season and then he crossed the Jamuna River alone without his army because his army was waiting and he called out, oh, uh, it was the morning hour and Lavana had gone to gather his breakfast. So he had a long spear and on his long spear was all these bodies of tigers and deer and elephant heads and you know he, he had a big appetite and it, blood dripping down and coming back boom, boom, boom. Yeah, he's a monster and here is Shatrugna brandishing his sword saying fight me and I will destroy you you're a, you're a wicked demon and Lavana just laughed and said you're just this little tiny creature. You'll fit very nicely on my big spear here. But one moment, let me go inside and gather my weapons. And Shatrugna said, you're just a coward. You're running inside your, your palace out of fear of me. Stand and fight like a man. <laughs> Which infuriated Lavanasura, so he put his bloody spear down and started combat. And Shatrugna was, you know, very expert with his sword, very powerful sword, and they fought some time. Lavana knocked with his, with a tree trunk or something, knocked Shatrugna to the ground, and he thought he was dead. So... Um, Lavana went to, you know, get his breakfast kettle ready. That was his, you know, his catch. Shatrugna woke up, became, became externally conscious again, and 
at just as Lavana was about to enter into the palace, he called him and called him something, you know, some heroic words and chivalrous speech and Lavana came charging at him and he finished him. And when he finished him, everyone, the, the sages certainly were very, very happy. And um, Shatrugna stayed in the palace that was built by Lavana's father, Madhu, and he stayed there to just like right the situation because everything had been corrupted for his whole lifetime. It took some while to put it back in order and he was already anointed as the king. So he stayed there for one year. And after one year, he had his, you know, people set up to run the city and everything became very nice because it was Vrindavan. And then um, he was very much missing Ram. So he put some of his ministers in charge of the kingdom so he could go back to Ayodhya visit Ram after one year. And visiting Ram, Ram was very happy. The Everyone was very happy to see him. He stayed for some time. And Ram told him, you have to go back. It's like it's describing here. Because you're the king and, and the, the, the kingdom needs a qualified king. And this is your service. You can serve me in separation. And, of course, he didn't want to serve in separation, but Ram was ordering him, so he went back and, and remained there. So those of you that may visit Vrindavan, um, you may want, especially with Dina Bandhu, you may want to go to Madhuvan. And Madhuvan happens to be a place where also Dhruva Maharaj performed his austerities in Dhruvatila. It's in, also in Madhuvan. And some other very nice pastimes. But there's a little temple, a Sitaram Lakshman Hanuman temple, where in Madhuvan, Shatrugna is said to have stayed. So the, the place is there, the pastime took place there. There was at once a big city in Madhuvan. Now it's not a big city anymore. It was quite some time ago. So the, the, now, the, the, but it, it has, in, in the course of the whole narration, there's a, there's a connection between Vrindavan and the other dams, like Ayodhya, a transcendental connection that's eternal, it's in spiritual. And so it's, it was fitting for Shatrugna to reside there and preside there and rule there and establish the, uh, the virtue of Ram during his pastimes in Vrindavan. So I'm sure I got some of the details not exactly right in that narration, but basic storyline is there. That just is it's one of the characteristics of Ram. He didn't allow his brothers just to stay in luxury and comfort and their own, their own happiness was not the, the plan of Ram. The well-being of the citizens and giving protection to others and establishing the standards of virtue throughout the land. That's, that's Lord Ramachandra. Any discussion? Yes. Why don't you go ahead without the microphone? About humility. I've seen pictures of Lord Ram worshipping uh, Lord Shiva. Is it out of humility that Lord Ram worships Lord Shiva? And why would Shiva allow himself to be worshipped by Lord Ram? I've heard the first part of the question asked at least a hundred times, but the second part has never been asked. But the second part is Lord Shiva 
his, he's a servant and Lord Ram can do whatever he wants to do. So, um, there's two explanations that I've heard and there's probably more than two. One of them is Ram was, um, his leela was to instruct in the nature of an ideal king. So an ideal king will, will offer respect to others, including the demigods. An ideal king will, will do like that. So he was setting that standard. Not that he was feeling himself dependent, because some people interpret that way, of course, dependent upon the mercy of Lord Shiva. He was setting a standard of before undertaking some activity, receiving blessings from great personalities that as ideal kings should do. But another is, um, as uh, how do Vaishnavas regard Lord Shiva? He's the one who's, one of his services is the protector of the Dham. And like in, in, in Vrindavan and in Mayapur, he serves that Kshetrapal Shiv function or a service. So um, seeing in his Leela, seeing Lord Shiva in that way, he was seeking the, you know, the access to the, a, a, a very difficult service, enter, in entering into a very difficult service. As Vaishnavas, Gaudiya Vaishnavas, approach Lord Shiva in a similar way. Those are two explanations that I've heard. And again, there's probably others. Anyone else? Um, our eternal, we have like every soul has eternal relationship uh, with Krishna in different, could be different incarnations. So, uh, like what happens uh, when we come to the material world? Like it's mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita, like the spirit soul is very tiny, like spark. D does the spiritual body uh, gets diminished or... Does the spiritual body get... Like shrunk or... Shrunk? <laughs> I've never heard that question either. <laughs> um... No. Um, the, the word that Prabhupada used on many occasions was individuality, our spiritual individuality becomes suspended. And then, then the converse is the spiritual body becomes manifest. So... It's not, the spiritual form is not to be thought of in terms of, you know, inches or feet or yards or meters or miles or something. It's not by material measure that one manifests a spiritual form. It's, it's as a for example, um, in the Srimad Bhagavad, the, the, the size of the super soul is expressed as the size of a thumb. So, uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur uh, provides a commentary where he says, he refers to the Kena Upanishad, I believe also, that speaks like that, where the, the, the soul, the super soul is the size of a thumb. And he says that uh, it's metaphorical language to, to um, indicate that one should meditate on the Lord in the heart or of the heart. And since the heart is the size of a thumb approximately, 
is metaphorical language. It's not to be understood that the super soul is the size of a thumb or six inches or whatever. That's what Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says. It's to give us, you know, something of an idea. So, because at the same time, um, he's within the heart. You know, what does exactly that mean? If you if you re, if you have a heart transplant, then he stays. Another heart comes in. His super soul is still there. The individual soul is still there. And that same super soul that's within the heart is also within an atom. So, how do we how do we put those two things together? It's 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 not by some material measure, in short. So, when the soul is in the material world, there the spiritual form of that soul, just to repeat is their, their, their identity is suspended. The spiritual identity is there, but it's not on a conscious level because the attention is turned elsewhere. But spiritual form and spirit soul, they're eternal. So it's not shrunk. It's suspended. Whatever exactly that means, I can't say. It's suspended. And then... We, we know from the other way around, from Narada's description, at the time that the soul left his body in the previous lifetime, in the previous day of Brahma, as lightning and illumination occurs simultaneously, the spiritual form was manifest when the soul left the body. So it, it, was, it was not manifest, at least to his conscious awareness, but spirit soul was manifest at that moment so it, it was there but then manifest as opposed to unmanifest different than shrunken <laughs> yes wait, wait for the microphone you're going to speak slow and clear, right? Good. Thank you, Mark, for this class. Sorry I came late, but... Uh, how long does it take from a soul when he leaves his body to get a new body? Um, Prabhupada's teaching is that it's instantaneous. In fact, unless there is the next destination for the soul to go, the soul, the body is in... A coma, you've heard of that word, C-O-M-A, coma. Technically, the body is not functioning. But somehow, I don't know how it works medically, the body is not functioning, but some, some indication of life is still there. I don't know exactly how it works. But it's, it's, so it's a condition where they're neither here nor there. And sometimes persons come back to conscious state from a coma, and sometimes they don't. So in that comatose state, Prabhupada explained, that a decision is being made. Where's the soul's next destination? Because they can't leave until they have a place to go. They don't like go and hang out until there's a place to go. They go to the next place instantly. Okay? Right behind you. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you very much. The process of hearing was discussed. Yes. I was wondering about the other processes of devotional service, if they have the same effect as what was discussed in this context. Yes. They're to be joined with, according to Jiva Goswami, with chanting. Or in hearing proceeds chanting. So hearing and chanting are connected to the other processes. I'm remembering, I'm not sure if this is accurate, that the processes are non-different, the processes of, de of devotional service? They're absolute. Okay. And that which is absolute, one can say non-different, but there's difference. 
even where there's not a difference. Yeah, okay. Is there... Would it be inaccurate to think of one process as more powerful than another? Potent? Well, <coughs> hearing is, is... Hearing and chanting are essential for the others to be effective. Not necessarily more potent. I, I'm, I'm tempted to ask you a question. How does the answer to that question help you advance in Krishna consciousness? Questions, this is just, besides, you know, information, it, it's, it's best if questions are relevant to how, how one can um, make progress in Krishna consciousness. Our, our basic activity the Bhagavad Dharma process is, begins with hearing and chanting, and from that hearing and chanting, the other activities flow, like the, the deity worship and, and prayer, and serving the lotus feet, and, and so on. The other processes of bhakti flow from the hearing and chanting, and that's where that's like a, that's our foundation. And it's not like we 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 want the foundation so we can go to something that's more potent foundation stays regardless of whatever else we're doing and the, 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 the efficacy of them must be um, to, to, it, they must be accompanied with hearing and chanting in order for their efficacy to be experienced by us fully I mean imagine deity worship without hearing and chanting or prayer without hearing and chanting it's just not effective But when, when joined in that way, absolute, of the same absolute nature. We hear in nectar devotion that one can achieve perfection through any one of the processes. So they're equally potent. Jiva Goswami just adds this other elaborate description of they must be joined with chanting. And he gives his reasons why, from scripture. I think that's sufficient. Yeah. Maharaj, you specifically mentioned the oral reception. Is there a difference between reading or specifically maybe discussing in association of devotees? A, a different yeah. effect is it? There's a difference. Reading is not the same as hearing. Reading is not the same as hearing. Reading is not the same as hearing. Have you noticed? Yes. I have one other question, but go Kunandi. No question. You have a question? Yes. Okay, go ahead. I'm running out of time, so I'll just yeah. take this one question. I'm going to... Regarding envy? Uh, regarding? Uh, envy. Envy. So it is said that by hearing the glories of the Rama or Krishna, one can become free from envy. Um, but my question is that usually when we hear about the glories of someone, we become envious. Um... And also Krishna tells Arjuna that I'm telling you this knowledge because you are not envious of me. So my question is, if there is any previous pur pur purification stage to being able to enter into the process of hearing the glories of the Lord in order to overcome envy? Um, let's just say this. The potency is there to overcome envy. Shishupal, classic. You know, he overcame his envy by getting killed by Krishna. <laughs> uh, 
but what you're saying is true. Persons, what you're saying is true. When, when glories of Krishna are presented, or glories of Krishna's potencies, don't even have to mention Krishna, just the potencies, the all-powerful nature of God, for someone who is envious, they writhe. They're, they're really uncomfortable with, with all of that. But the potency is there. So if that person becomes envious towards the glories of Krishna, they'll become purified one way or another way. You know, favorable disposition, unfavorable disposition. You know, like you know, Harinam. Some people like Harinam. Some people don't really like Harinam at all. Some people really hate Harinam. They're getting purified. Just have to make sure we have our permits with us. <laughs> Is that all right? Yes. Um, it does connect with the offense, the nine offense. Sure. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, okay. Um, well, let's take a look at our founder, Acharya. He presented Krishna book to the world. And was there risk involved? Sure. When one is preaching, one engages in risk. But what he wanted to do was not knowing, he told us this, not knowing how long he would live, he wanted to have, to leave behind a rendering of the 10th canto that would eliminate, or let's say minimize, um, the misinterpretations of you know, licentious people, especially the rasa dance and, and other pastimes of Krishna, to give a, a proper perspective to unqualified people to understand Krishna's pastimes. That was his intent in Krishna book. So, was there a risk of the ninth offense? Yeah. When we engage in book distribution in general. But the, the, the purports are given by our founder, Chari, who certainly knows such a tendency is out there in the, in the marketplace. And so, on his behalf, we distribute his literature, presented in such a way that to help diffuse that and help at least give persons the, the chance to overcome their contamination. But it's a, it's a very thoughtful question. Thank you. I'm going to end because I have to leave. Thank you very much. Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Yeah.